Uh, good morning. My name is Andrew Kola. I'm the assist, or sorry, I'm the youth pastor here at Six Points Church. Force a habit. My bad. I do assist lots of people in many different things, but my primary role at this church is for the youth group, these hooligans down here who so much love shenanigans and tomfoolery. Yeah, yep, that's you guys. Well, I get to, easy buddy, I get to kick off a sermon series this week that was actually supposed to start last week. Um, however, sometimes things don't always go according to plan as, as we have planned them. However, this Sunday, I had always been planned to preach this sermon. So we are back on track. In fact, at the beginning of the year, Pastor Scott and Pastor Lisa and I, we actually we collaborate to see who's going to be preaching on what Sundays. And the summer was kind of like a, what's going on? Okay, what's, what's happening? Guest speakers. And we're back on track. This is now where we're resuming back on normal schedule as of today. And we'll be carrying out, hopefully, at a normal pace for the rest of the year. The sermon series that we are in today is called Heart of a Leader. If you look on your bulletin, it says Moses. That is a typo. We are not talking about Moses today, although Moses is a phenomenal leader and there is a lot that we can learn from him. That was the series we did last time. Last year we did Heart of a Leader and we talked about Moses' leadership. This year we're going to be talking about Jesus' leadership. Leadership lessons from the Savior himself. So that is where we are going to be this week, and next week Scott will preach a sermon that is in tandem with this one. But before we launch into that, I need to share some information with you all. I have a struggle in my life. This is an ongoing issue um, that I've wrestled with ever since I was about 16. Um, almost every single day this issue persists. It affects my mood. Um, if I don't keep it in check, it can ruin my whole day, it can affect my marriage. It is not a fun issue to wrestle with. Caitlin has called me out on it multiple times. Um, it is, in fact, road rage. Yeah. 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 Who can relate? Who can relate? Be honest. This is, this is honesty. Amen. Now, <coughs> I, I consider... I consider myself a good driver. Now, I put, I put that in quotes um, because I, when I say good driver, I mean that I follow traffic laws to an annoying degree, like to the letter, with, the ex with a few exceptions. Like I'll, if the traffic is speeding on an interstate like five or so over the speed limit, I'll go about with the pace of traffic. But specifically with stop signs and stop lights, I come to a complete stop, and it annoys everyone else at the stop sign. Yeah, it annoys. You want to know why? Because everyone's gotten so used to cutting edges and kind of obeying the rules a little bit, but not quite all of the rules. And I am the one putting everyone else in a bad mood and in danger for following the rules as they have been outlined. So we're going to have some traffic lessons today. Just, just some very, just bear with me, just a few traffic lessons. Um, it's going to be a, a two-hour lecture. Just kidding. It's going to be a, <coughs> it's only going to be four slides. <laughs> so let's talk about stop signs, okay? And I promise this will connect to my, ser to my sermon. I promise it will. Stop signs are my biggest pet peeve, and Caitlin can attest to this. Almost every time I drive past that stop sign in Sheridan by the gas stations by Biddle Park, whew, I get, I get mad. That stop sign is the worst stop sign I have ever stopped at ever. It, it needs to, something's got to give. That stop sign needs change. Amen. <laughs> Praise. <laughs> Praise God. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. With the tomfoolery, guys. <clears throat> um, so that stop sign in particular has contributed greatly to my feelings on stop signs in general. Um, and I'm sure that many of you in this room can attest to personal stories that I have told you complaining about that specific stop sign. I'm n I know I've talked to Tony Cox, wherever he is, a number of times. I've talked to Pastor Scott and a number of you. That stop, I just, mm, 
man, I'm getting, I'm getting mad. I should, whew, here we go. The reason I'm telling you about these driving frustrations that I experience is because I had a realization recently. Uh, Caitlin and I were going to go see a movie at an AMC theater over in uh, Traders Point, and there's a stop, there's an always stop sign outside that theater, and um, which, as you know, I love stop signs. So, at that intersection, I arrive first. So, well, hold on. Before I continue, let's go over let's go over some traffic laws. So, no, rule number one, at stop signs, stop. Do not proceed. Let your vehicle come to a complete halt. Then you may go under the following conditions. Rule number two, the first car to arrive has the right of way. If you arrive at the stop sign before anyone else, congratulations. Once you've made your complete stop, you may proceed through the intersection. You did it. I'm being serious. Rule number two, or sorry, rule number three, stop signs. If two or more cars arrive at the same time, the car furthest to the right has the right of way. Not the cars to the left, the cars to the right have the right of way. Remaining cars may then proceed in a clockwise pattern. Everyone knows how a clock works, right? So if this, I'm looking for you guys, so this is the hour hand, it does not go this way. It goes this way, clockwise. Okay? Clockwise. Awesome. Rule number four, and this one may be the most important rule, the right of way is always given by the yielding drivers. It is not taken. Okay? If you have the right of way, you wait for everyone else to give you that right before you drive. I know it seems backwards because legally you have the right of way, but we all want to avoid collisions, right? How many of you have been in a traffic collision? They're not fun. They're not a good time. In fact, one of the worst accidents that I've ever been in was at a stop sign, and I didn't even have to stop. It was a two-way stop with cross-traffic not stopping, and some guy was like, hmm, this is optional, and blew it, and I T-boned him at about 30 miles an hour. Barb remembers. She had to come pick me up in Indianapolis. Remember that, Barb? That was a stressful day. That was a stressful day. Totaled my dad's car. It was not a fun time. Anyway, <clears throat> part of my personality gets frustrated with traffic laws because as I was saying in this in accident that I was in, not accident, sorry, this interaction I had um, at a stop sign at the theater with Caitlin. So this person and I, we are arriving at the stop sign, but I arrive at the stop sign first, which means I have the right of way. Now I could tell, because I've driven before, that the person approaching the stop sign after me was not going to stop. I could tell that. And I chose to proceed through the intersection anyway, so that I could honk at them when they cut me off. <laughs> now you're all laughing, but Caitlin was not laughing <laughs> when, when that happened. It was, it, was a, it was a moment where she was like, you didn't need to do that. And I felt justified, right? Because legally, I was following the rules, and that person wasn't. And I felt like it was my moral obligation to go through the intersection, slam on my brakes, and just lay on the horn. Now, that didn't change the fact that I was still mad afterward, and Caitlin was still worried, because she didn't know that was my plan. As far as she knew, I was just going to hit this guy. <laughs> And again, we want to avoid collisions. And I'm telling you this because part of me is twisted. I'm a broken, sinful person. And I'm sharing these stories. I know that they're relatable because I can tell from all of the laughter. And most of us in this room have driven before. And we know that driving with other people can be a really frustrating experience because most of the time we feel that we are in the right and we are justified in what we're doing and the other person is in the wrong, right? That's how we usually feel. When I did that, I, Caitlin called me out on it, that my attitude was not where it needed to be. I wasn't considering the safety of myself or the passengers in my car. I was considering 
justice and revenge, to show that other person that what they were doing was wrong, rather than just simply trying to keep everyone in my car safe, which is what a driver should be doing, right? How many of you drive buses? I know a few of you have. The, the priority is to keep your passengers safe and deliver them to their destination, right? That is the priority. Anything beyond that is unnecessary. Keep them safe. So, how does this connect to my sermon today? I'd love to share with you. So I'm going to ask you guys to turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, we're going to be in chapter 6. <clears throat> While you're turning to Luke chapter 6, I want to just take a brief moment and talk to you about the fourth commandment. Who knows off the, off the, like just from the memory what the fourth commandment is of the Ten Commandments? Anybody? Aubrey? No. <laughs> nope, no takesies, backsies. You said the wrong thing. Anyone else? No mercy up here today for Aubrey. Anyone else? No? It has to do with a day of the week, the Sabbath. Someone said it. Yes. Fourth commandment is about the Sabbath. So, God says in Exodus, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, for in six days... The Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So the commandment is to labor for six days and then take the seventh day, just as God did, to rest. That is the commandment. And I think it's interesting that he even includes your livestock. Your animals shall also rest and as someone who is not very familiar with animals, I have no idea how you can control whether or not your animal rests on the Sabbath. Maybe they run a side business. How can you tell? <laughs> anyway, that is kind of the prefix for where we are going into Scripture today. I had you guys turn to Luke chapter 6. We're going to be starting in verse 6. We're going to read verse 6 through 11. This is from the NIV. This is what the Scripture says. On another Sabbath, he, Jesus, went into the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or destroy it? He looked around at them all and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. In some of the other Gospels, they say that the Pharisees were already plotting to kill Jesus after this interaction. So this is a story in the Bible that I don't think gets a whole lot of love because it doesn't have a very satisfying ending, right? When we hear stories of Jesus healing people, what we really like about those stories is, yeah, we love that Jesus is healing people, but one of the things that we enjoy is the reaction from the people being healed or the people observing the healing. And this story does not have that. There is no resolution that we're like, wow, what a satisfying end. No, it says Jesus healed the guy and some other people were so mad about it that they wanted to kill Jesus. Moving on. And that doesn't feel like a very satisfying conclusion to that story. Now, fortunately, context, there is more around it, surrendering or, uh, surrounding it. And I have this rule that I like to share with my youth group and just in general, I never read just one passage of scripture. Never, this is my advice to you, just a, just a little tidbit. Never read just one passage of scripture. If someone is trying to argue a point or have a conversation with you and they use just one passage of scripture, pause. 
read the context, read the surrounding passages of scripture, try to figure out who was speaking to whom in that passage of scripture, why were they saying it, what significance did it have to the original audience, and then once you've considered all of those things, put it into its own context and then put it back into the person's argument, eh, well, no, maybe that doesn't actually hold up to what you're trying to tell me because context would suggest X, Y, Z. That's just my, my favorite thing to do. Always read multiple passages of scripture. Read it into its context. So speaking of context, let's look at the context of the passage we just read. Jesus had already begun. This is early on in his ministry, okay? He had already begun to acquire a strong reputation. And for some people, it was very good. And lots of people were attracted to Jesus because they heard of the miracles he was doing and they wanted to see or experience those miracles themselves. Some people were not too happy about Jesus, and his reputation for those people was bad because he was upsetting the status quo of the religious elite. And that is what these Pharisees were struggling with in this story. So, <clears throat> we know, another thing of context, we know that the Pharisees cared very much about the laws regarding the Sabbath. In fact, we know they cared about them so much that they even went out of their way to invent additional laws to outside of the authority of Scripture to keep them from being tempted to work on the Sabbath or break the laws of the Sabbath. You could say that they cared about the Sabbath almost as much as I care about stop signs. Almost. So let's unpack this passage together. We know that Jesus is already kind of developing a reputation. We know that the Pharisees care very strongly about the keeping of the Sabbath. Now, I, I read into some commentaries that typically when someone was to violate a law regarding the Sabbath, it wasn't done intentionally. It was accidental, and it was a very minor case, often a slap on the wrist, like, mm, you're not supposed to be doing that on the Sabbath. And for someone to intentionally violate the Sabbath was a bigger deal but none of that was worth capital punishment, which is what the Pharisees were considering for Jesus, who had violated this law. They really, really wanted him go gone. So, my first and ultimately my biggest takeaway from this passage when I was reading through it is that Jesus leads with unapologetic leadership. In fact, that's actually the title of today's sermon, unapologetic leadership. Now, what does that mean. What does the word unapologetic mean? Well, simply put, all it means is that he led without feeling a sense of regret for what he was doing. He knew what he was doing as he was doing it, and he knew it was the right thing to do, the good thing to do. So to do something unapologetically means that I am going to do something, and I am not going to regret it because I know that this is right. That's unapologetic leadership. So Jesus leads unapologetically. So what is the main point? My big takeaway is with that unapologetic leadership, here's what I want to say. And if you get nothing else today, if you forget everything I've shared, even the hilarious stop, site bi stop sign bit at the beginning, I want you to remember this one takeaway, which is this. If you want to live the way that Jesus lived, you have to lead the, we the way that Jesus led. If you want to live the way that Jesus lived, you have to lead the way that Jesus led. So we know we're supposed to live like Jesus. It's written all over Scripture that we are to act like our Savior. In fact, one of my favorite passages in the Bible is written uh, by a man named Paul in his letter to the church in Ephesus. Um, Paul writes this in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. He says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And some translations even say be imitators of God, right? Follow God's example. Imitate his actions. So what does that look like? How do we follow in Christ's example? Jesus lived over 2,000 years ago. And here we are in the 21st century, and we're supposed to follow his example, and all we have is the text, the disciples' um, testimony of the Gospels in the New Testament, the letters that Paul had written. This is, this is really all we have to go off of. Well, I would argue that that is more than enough, and I will give you a practical example from my own personal experience. We've all imitated things before, right? Yeah, okay, sorry. 
I usually work with the youth group and I'm used to like more feedback. So like, feel free to be like, yeah, uh-huh, raise your hand and, and give me some emphatic head nods. That'd be great. We've all imitated things before, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. So, he knows what he did. I don't even need to say anything. So, when I want to sh share a story, right? We imitate things for all sorts of reasons, whether it be to just be silly, to mock someone, or to learn something. We've all imitated people or things before, and I want to share this story. When I was in high school, I was in marching band. Who, who was in marching band in high school? <laughs> nerds! Just kidding. <laughs> <We've> <laughs> I was in marching band, too. We're all nerds here. It's fine. Um, I, I actually loved it, and I'd love to talk to you about your experiences in marching band. That was probably my most cherished memories from high school were in the marching band. And as a student in the marching band, I auditioned my freshman year to be the drum major of the marching band for my sophomore year. And I landed it, and I was the drum major for my sophomore, junior, and senior year. And I had an absolute blast. Now, for those of you who don't know what a drum major is, it is nothing to do with playing the drums. It actually is the person who stands in front of the band on the podium and conducts with their hands, like this. And so I stood in front of the band, and I would conduct, and I would give cues, and I would do cutoffs, and that was my whole job. I stood in front of the band, and I conducted them, and I loved it. However, when I started, I was terrible at it. I was no good at all, and I needed to get good to lead the band, because if a band doesn't have clear cues, they're not going to know when to come in, they're not going to know when the downbeat of a measure is, and the sound is going to be bad if you're not giving them clear leadership. That's a problem. And so, I needed to figure out how to do drum majoring well. And the way that I did that is I was taught by my band director, and I want to share the way in which he taught me. It's a really, really cool story. He, we have, so our high school had this like dressing room for like theater, for like plays and musicals and stuff, and the whole room was just coated in mirrors all over the place because all of these students getting into costume, you're trying to put on makeup and stuff like that. So the whole room's coated in mirrors. And so we went in there, and he brought this little radio speaker thingy, and he put the marching show on, and he had me stand right next to him. So he would stand here, and I would stand here, and we would both look straight forward. We could see each other in the mirror, and we were listening to the show, and I would try to conduct the show next to my band director, Mr. Padgett. And I could see in the mirror how good and clean and crisp his movements were as he kind of bounced a little bit with the song, or if it was a more smooth and legato song, he would gently flow his hands kind of like he was bringing them through water and he would do these big sweeping motions and it was really really cool and I'm over here like but I could see the difference because of the mirror because I was looking at the comparison between the two of us I could see I am clearly not as experienced as him and so what I was trying to do is try to match his movements exactly and he would give me pointers and tell me how to do this with my arms or whatever how to breathe how to bounce with my heels a little bit. And eventually, at the end of all of these training sessions, I started to look more like the master. You see where I'm going with this? Can you kind of tell a little bit where I'm going to be going with this? I was imitating him, and it was making me a better leader. And so eventually, I went in front of the band, and we play at our shows, and we won awards, and it was not all just because of me. The band did a great job, too, but I owe it to the teachings of my band director, who had the patience to sit down and show me, motion for motion, what to do with my body. And that was how I imitated a master to learn how to do the job correctly. <clears throat> so, this is what the disciples were trying to do with Jesus as they followed him around. And it should be what we try to do with Jesus. We should watch as we read scripture, how is Jesus interacting with people? And compare, how do I interact with people? Am I doing things the way that Jesus would do them? And if not, maybe we should try to work on making it so that we are doing the things that Jesus was doing. Now that's all good and fun. We all want to have the life of Jesus but few of us are willing to surrender our comfort in order to have the lifestyle of Jesus. And sometimes that comfort includes our selfish attitude towards other drivers on the freeway. So, 
Like I said earlier, if we want to live like Jesus lived, we have to lead like Jesus led. So this begs the question, how did Jesus lead? Well, let's go back and let's look at that passage again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read starting in verse 6, Luke 6, 6 again. Here we go. I'm going to stop halfway through. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and he was teaching. Okay, so Jesus was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Verse 8 is key. This is what we're going to talk about. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. I'm going to pause. If we're going to lead how Jesus led, and we're going to follow his example, how are we supposed to know what's going on inside the thoughts of others? Because Jesus is seen doing that multiple times. It's documented that he knew the thoughts of people who were doubting him. He knew what the Pharisees were thinking before they said anything. How are we supposed to follow a leader who can literally read thoughts? Right? That's not something that we are capable of. However, we, we are capable of reading a room, right? As in that intersection with, with, at the movie theater, I could tell he wasn't going to stop. I knew he wasn't going to stop. And I chose to put us in a situation where it just made me angry. And it really didn't affect him at all, I don't think. I don't know. I've never had another interaction with him. But I could tell, right? Where we have the ability to read a room. So, supporting points. Number one, Jesus knew that healing on the Sabbath would have been frowned upon and hated by the religious elite. He knew they weren't going to respond positively to what he was doing that day. He was very aware of that. Jesus went into the situation aware of the room. He knew that it was about to ruffle some feathers. However, although he knew what the Pharisees were thinking, and he probably knew how they would respond, his intention was not simply to make them mad for the sake of making them mad. Right? That's just petty. And we know that Jesus isn't a petty person. He's the savior of the world. His interaction with the Pharisees certainly stirred the pot, but his intention was not just to make them upset for the sake of making them upset. His primary goal that day was to heal a man with a shriveled hand and teach. He was in the synagogue, what? Teaching. That was his, that's why he was there in the first place. He was also there to demonstrate why God made the Sabbath at all. That's really quick. I want to take a look at a passage in Mark chapter 2. Um, this is another passage about the Sabbath and another interaction between Jesus and his disciples and the Pharisees. And Mark chapter 2, 27 says this. Or 22 through 27, excuse me. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and his disciples walked along. They began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, wh why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, have you ever read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which was lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And this passage leads me directly into my second point for today, which is this. Jesus cared more about loving people rather than strictly following a tradition for the sake of following a tradition. Now, don't get me wrong. The law is good. Jesus fulfilled the law. He obeyed all of it. God gave the Israelites the law not to be oppressive. He gave them the law to help them and to set them apart from the rest of the world so that through these chosen people, a savior might come to save us all from sin. Jesus asks the Pharisees in this passage in Mark, or in, in Luke, excuse me, he gets up and he asks them the question, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? And I'll ask you that question too. What's lawful on the Sabbath? Is it to do good or is it to do evil? Now, our culture does not nearly hold as much authority on the law of the Sabbath, as, at least not as much as I think we should. 
We think we tend to ignore that more than we tend to obey it. But let's imagine that we all strictly follow the Sabbath as if the Pharisees would have, right? And Jesus asks you this question. Is it lawful to do good or evil on the Sabbath? What would you say to that? I imagine you would say it's lawful to do good. We know in this passage that no answer from the Pharisees are ever documented. If they said anything at all, it doesn't make it into the passage, which leads me to assume that they, did, they were just in silence. They didn't say anything. So in order to kind of communicate the point and purpose, I'm going to have you guys do a little exercise with me, okay? Close your eyes real quick. Close your eyes, and I want you to imagine. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay out some stuff for you, and I want you to imagine it. Imagine with me that you are a German citizen in Berlin in 1939. You believe in and worship God, and you do not like your new chancellor. You especially hate that he is trying to pin the nation's problems on the Jewish people. You are not Jewish, but you know that they haven't done anything to deserve what is happening to them. You decide to risk your life by harboring and protecting Jewish families as they try to make their escape. One day, as you have a Jewish family in your home, you hear the Gestapo approaching and knock at your door. In a hurry, the family hides as you answer the door. The German soldiers look you up and down and ask, are you hiding any Jews in your home? Open your eyes. Now what? What would you do in a situation like that? You know that it's wrong to lie. It is very clear in multiple places in Scripture. It's even one of the Ten Commandments that we should not lie. It's very clear. However, you know that if you don't lie, this Jewish family is probably going to die. That seems like a, a tough situation to be in. A more biblical example of this situation would probably be found in Joshua chapter 2, with the spies from the Hebrews trying to scout out Jericho, and they take refuge in the house of the prostitute Rahab, who then lies to the king's messenger about the whereabouts of the spies to protect the spies because she knows that they have come on the will of God. She lies, but it is for the good of the Israelite nation. But she lies. We know that lying is wrong. So here's what I would believe. And if you disagree with me on this, I would love to invite you to have a conversation with me about it later. Here's what I believe. Lying to save someone's life is not a situation that happens very often. In fact, I would argue that the odds are you're probably never going to be in that situation ever. However, if you are in that situation, one, I think it's important to consider your options and pray that you're within obedience to God and consider what God would want. I think that it would be okay to lie in that situation, in a life or death situation, to save someone's life. That's what I believe. And if, again, if you disagree with me on that, we can have a conversation about it later. But that's what I would argue. Now, I know that the situation with the Sabbath and Jesus eating, or his disciples eating grain and healing on the Sabbath are very different situations from Rahab lying to the king's messenger and... Um, <clears throat> the German family lying to the Gestapo, right? Those are very different situations. The context in those situations is very different. But I think either way, they showcase the purpose of God's law is for the betterment of his people and not to oppress them, as I said earlier. So the Pharisees had taken this law of the Sabbath and they were following it so strictly that it had become oppressive toward people and not beneficial. They were twisting its original intended purpose. Both examples, all of the things we've just said, help us to see God's love and eventually make us more like him. And my final point for today is this. Within this passage in Luke, Jesus loves in two very clear ways. Healing and rebuke. Jesus was the perfect leader. 
his encounter in Luke 6, we see that it is Jesus kind of hitting two birds with one stone in this interaction. If you have ever read uh, any of the Gospels, you can find them littered with examples and stories and miracles of Jesus healing people, right? It's all over the place. We see Jesus healing people who are sick. We even see him resurrect people from the dead. It's incredible, the miracles that he is doing. So why does Jesus heal people? And I would argue that Jesus heals people. Why does he heal the man with a shriveled hand? He, he heals people because, one, we know that it was prophesied in Isaiah that the Savior would heal people with ailments. In Isaiah 53, you can find that prophecy there. On one hand, he's fulfilling that prophecy as the Messiah. On another hand, I believe, simply put, it's because he loves us, and he wants us to experience that love, one, firsthand, and two, so that we will respond with love to our Savior, right? That's what worship is. Worship isn't just us gathering at a church because it's our, our duty as a Christian to sit in church and worship the Lord, and I've checked that off my box. No, this is a response. What we're doing here is a response to God's love. We want to respond to that grace in worship. That's what worship is. So Jesus heals us so that we can experience that love firsthand and also so that we can respond and love him in return. So that is why Jesus heals, but why was he in the synagogue to teach that day? And I think that the other reason is because he wanted to stir the pot a little bit. Now I know that earlier I said Jesus wasn't just trying to make the Pharisees mad for the sake of making them mad, right? Like my attitude towards that other driver was simply just because I felt like they were in the wrong and I need to show them that they're in the wrong by honking my horn and look, clearly you violated this traffic law, it's my right of way. No, Jesus' attitude wasn't like that. He loved the Pharisees too, just like he loved the disciples, just like he loves the Jewish families in Germany, just like he loved the Gestapo, just like he loves you or me or anyone else that has ever lived or that will ever live. His love does not know any boundaries. It is limitless. Not everybody responds to that love, unfortunately, but his love cannot be stopped. And so his love extends to the Pharisees that day, and in, they, I think, needed love in a different way than the man with the shriveled hand. You see, they were, as I said earlier, taking and twisting one of God's laws into an oppressive law, and Jesus was like, mm-mm, that's not what the intended purpose was. And he demonstrates it by healing on the Sabbath and saying, what is lawful, to do good or evil on the Sabbath? If we want to live the way that Jesus lived, then we need to lead the way that Jesus led. Jesus had a wise and a loving heart who knew when to show mercy and when to show rebuke. And that's the key. And that's where I usually fail is because when I show rebuke, I don't always do so with a loving heart. I do so out of a twisted sense of superiority, that I feel that I'm better than someone else, that I'm in the right. But I'm a sinner. You're sinners. We're all sinners. None of us are in the right. And so when Jesus rebukes, I think we should learn from his example that day as he wasn't there just to make people mad. He was there to teach. He was there to heal. And he was there to love. Our attitude changes the way that we handle those interactions. That day, as I was driving with Caitlin, I should have just stopped and let that other driver pass. There's nothing I could have done about it. Being mad and honking wasn't going to change the situation. I wish I had thought of that before I made my wife upset. Sorry, Caitlin. I love you. I want to leave you with this, because many things in our life are out of control, and we'll face situations where people have really hurt you and they've done things, and you feel like this person has wronged me, and I want justice. But justice, when it's up to us, is not usually very good. We should leave it to God. And so I want to just, real quick, I want to leave with this passage from Romans chapter 12. 17 through 21 says this, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of Excuse me, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, 
feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And God is a good God, and he loves in good ways. And if we want to love the way that God loved, then we need to lead the way that he led. So church, will you pray with me today? Father, we are grateful that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins as the atoning sacrifice for all of that is wrong with this planet. But we know that although that was his primary purpose, he had other purposes as well, and those were to teach us and to show us the way, to lead by example. And so God, I ask that when we are in situations where we are feeling frustrated, flustered, mad, or wronged, and we want justice, that we will yield to your authority and trust in you. That when we rebuke people who are doing things that are wrong or bad, we will do so with a loving heart. That our motives won't simply be just to make other people feel wrong or bad, but our motive will be to help them, to teach them, to correct their behavior so that the wrong continues no more. God, we want to be more like you. We want to be faithful servants who trust you. I ask all of these things today in the holy and powerful name of Jesus. Amen.